This is the Business of Apps podcast, bringing you actionable insights from the leaders of the global app industry and the world's fastest growing apps. You can find more app news, data and analysis over at businessofapps.com. Welcome to the Business of Apps podcast. On this show, we invite app industry professionals to cover various topics. We promise to do our best to keep it both insightful but brief. On this episode, we have Paul Barnes, Managing Director, Europe, Middle East, Asia at App Any. Paul, welcome to the Business of Apps podcast. Thanks, John. It's good to be here. Great. All right. We all live in the world of apps. We long passed the slogan, there's an app for that, because it's not about novelty anymore. It's just part of your life. Apps cover pretty much every aspect of your existence. Today, it's all about how useful an app for you It's about the value it delivers to you. Now, if you're a brand or publisher, you need somebody who can take a bird view on the whole app ecosystem and give you a snapshot of what apps are popular globally or in specific countries, what app categories are on their peak or vice versa, and so much more. Since 2010, such company has been AppAnny, the mobile data and analytics company, which Apple itself quotes from time to time when it talks about App Ecosystem. App Any issues quarter and annual reports, and today we're going to be talking about the state of mobile 2020 report. But before jumping on this, Paul, why don't you give our listeners a bit of your background? Sure, will do, Archam. And thanks for the uh, overview there. That was a great intro to, to App Any. Thank you so much. Personally, my background, I've always, oh, I actually started out as a finance person originally in, in my career. I, I did three or four years of that. But really since then, I've always been in tech and fairly early stage, fast moving in tech. I did a, a stint in speech recognition, spent some time in um, digital customer experience and web chat, these kinds of things. Um, and from there into market research software. And that's really what brought me to App Annie. It was just incredible to see the disruption that was happening in market research and analysis as, as the world shifted to mobile sort of four or five years ago. So that really caught my attention. And uh, fortunately enough, I was able to, to move to App Annie and, and play a small part in that. All right, great. Now let's talk about the report. First, please tell us about the report. When did you begin to issue these reports and how has it evolved over time? Yeah, sure. So we've done an annual report of some form for around seven years. And, you know, the, the world's changed a lot in those seven years, if you think That's back. That's for sure. 2012, 2013, it was really different. We were very much talking about gaming, some of the, the t- top charts. I did a feature around it in apps, and some of like the early days, the top charts were apps for putting a torch on your phone and things like that. It was really kind of you know, a diff- different world, as I say. But over time, whereas maybe uh, six, seven, six years ago, we were looking about downloads and where the biggest downloads were and what the biggest game was and so on. It's evolved over that time uh, pretty much what you said, Archom, about apps having become the the core of of how we live our lives. So we've seen it evolve into cover all these different sectors like entertainment, music streaming, more recently video streaming, the kind of utility apps around travel and so on. But the data we've covered in the reports changed as well. So it's moved from downloads much more into usage, understanding how people interact with apps. So frequency of sessions, length of time, these kinds of things. And then more recently, maybe the last three or four years, perhaps it's been increasingly about revenue. We spend so much of our money through the stores. We monetize through advertising in mobile. And of course, there's e-commerce on top of all of that as well. So, so it's a very different world now. But I think this year's report is really fascinating. There's some big things going on, uh, which hopefully we'll get a chance to, to come and talk about. All right. So let's jump to the specifics of this year's report. How much time do people spend with their beloved mobile devices? I hope it's not 24-7. What is the (laughs) general trend and does it go up, down? What countries are leading the pack and spend the most? And uh, in what countries people do spend the least amount of time on mobile? 
Yeah, that's it's a good way to look at it. And for me, it's the most interesting numbers. I think you know, the the kind of top line around downloads is starting to flatten out in growth, but we see relentless growth in every country. So you look at it from 2015 to 16 to 17 to 18 to 19. Pretty much every country in the world, year on year, we see an increase in the amount of time that people are spending in app. And currently, average globally is three hours, 40 minutes per day spent in app, which is a pretty big number. Um, if you, one of my colleagues was working it out yesterday, if you assume you get eight hours sleep a day, which uh -huh. I would love to get eight hours a day, but uh, that's, yeah, yeah. that's the way. I hear you. <laughs> then it's around it's around a quarter of your waking time spent in apps, which is, is pretty amazing, right? You raised a good point about regional differences, country differences. If you look at, I mean, I, I'm sat here in London in the UK, and it's, it's a bit less. So it's around, rather than 3.7 hours global average, it's more like 2.4. And you see that consistently across markets like France and Germany. It's pretty much the same. But at the other end of the spectrum, the, the country that always I, I always reference as a standout is Indonesia. So the number of hours per user per day there is, is over four and a half hours, oh my God. which is vast. But I think there's a good rationale for it, which is in some of the countries like Indonesia, they've almost skipped the desktop generation. So right. digital, digital equals mobile, digital equals apps. Um, that, that's how they've adopted the, the digital world. So it's perhaps you know, less surprising that um, they spend so much time there. Yeah, there was a leapfrog for them, but uh, just skip PCs at all. And uh, probably it can be uh, justified by the uh, download speed. Like some of them may not be covered by uh, broadband internet and they have to spend more time to digest the same amount of content as we do here in Europe or, or in the States. Yeah, I think that's true. And you see you see that in, in the kind of usage and the of, of different sorts of apps. If you look in a mature market, say Japan, you see that mm -hmm. people are they're spending a lot of time in apps, but they're starting to consolidate more around certain apps. So then people get more used to, they've finished experimenting, if you like, and they're looking for a number of go-to apps that they can spend a lot of time in. Whereas in more emerging markets, partly what you say with maybe data or bandwidth restrictions, people are chopping and changing a bit more. But also I think people are you know, finding out which apps suit their lifestyle best. And over time, we'd expect to see that same kind of consolidation in those markets. So that's a real, um, a real challenge and, or opportunity for app publishers, I think, to, as time goes on, how do you make sure you're one of those apps that people are going to invest in significant time in, and you want to be one of those go-to apps for them. Do you have any insight on the different age, like um, how, how the data is being influenced by uh, different age groups? Do you see Gen Z or millennials spend more time or less than the uh, baby boomers? Yeah, that's a really, really interesting point. And, and a big topic, I think, that came out of the report this year was Gen Z. There is noticeably different behavior with Gen Z. And I think it's it's understandable in that this is a generate. It's the first generation where their first the first phone they got was a smartphone. Um, there was no transition into the smartphone world for them. And what we see is Interestingly, they spend, and, and this surprises a lot of people, they spend less time in games, less significantly less time in mobile games than do 25 plus. But they spend a lot more time in app. So the number of sessions is about 50% higher, something like that, in terms of the, the number of, of sessions that Gen Z users are, are engaging in with non-gaming apps. And those are it's obviously social and messaging apps, but there's a lot of entertainment, a lot of content being consumed by that demographic where they're using the, the, the smartphone as the way that they, they choose as a, as, a, as a sort of first screen to look at. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm particularly interested in Gen Z, uh, the time, how much uh, this generation spends on mobile because I have a 14 years old daughter and it, it has kind of a personal resonance for me. Yeah. To see it firsthand. Now, 
And an interesting thing there that's happening is you're starting to see types of app use cross over. So if you look at that, that demographic, they're very, maybe not playing as many games, but actually quite big into apps like Twitch. So that idea of watching people play games, sort of that esports type of, uh, of, of, um, of category, it's things are blending together more for that demographic. I think that they, they don't bucket the, uh, the time they spend in, in entertainment in quite the way earlier, earlier generations did. It's more fluid. Yeah, it's interesting. I think, I think you have to belong to this generation to be able to understand it from inside why that's the case, why they're switching from playing themselves to just watching like other folks are playing. But this is the reality. Now, let's talk about games. Uh, what is the current market share of mobile games? Uh, how much money people spent last year on games? And what is the forecast for 2020? Yeah, so it's a it's a good topic and a good link, I think, from what we were talking about before. In the you know mobile games, in terms of downloads and time spent, it's not the the majority by far. The biggest amount of time we spend is in social and communication. That's about half the time we is where is, is, where, is what gaming controls. So our um, estimate for the size of the app stores. So this is taking all, all the app stores together in 2019 was around 120 billion dollars transacted through subscriptions, in-app purchases, and so on. But over 70% of that, so over 70% of the total spend goes on mobile gaming. And that's a vast number. That makes it $86 billion through mobile gaming. Um, and I think, you know, as part of that, it's really broadened the demographic out. There's this idea that mobile has democratized gaming and, and effectively you know, everybody is a gamer now, which isn't isn't true. But what mm -hmm. is true, the majority of people, the majority of people who are smartphone owners play games. So it's it's not a, a niche thing anymore. And I think you see that. You know, I'm a, I commute into into London. I travel around uh, Europe quite a lot, and you see almost every type of demographic and playing games, whether they're casual games or or core games. Really depends on the type of person, but you see it see it everywhere um, yeah, and there's no sign of that letting up um, the growth rates around 20 percent um, so our prediction and um, I made a little challenge to the to the mobile gaming community at a conference uh, a couple of weeks back that if it stays on track then mm -hmm. mobile gaming should be more than a hundred billion dollar market in 2020 which is you know this makes it a serious industry yeah, see, it's just, uh, it gives me kind of another justification for why Apple decided to give the App Store the separate category for games a couple of years ago, uh, because it's just, the, the market is huge and there's no, there, there aren't any signs that it's going to be getting less and less attention and investment um, years to come. Um, and you're, you're absolutely right. I can see a lot of people playing uh, casual games uh, while they're commuting. That's just the way of them, you know, get this few minutes uh, away from hard, uh, hard feelings or thoughts and just immerse to some uh, casual game for five, ten minutes. It's, it's consoles porting over as well is interesting. I think that's a big trend. Really? Yeah, yeah, so two of the biggest games that moved to mobile, that came on mobile, last year were Mario Kart and Call of Duty, which are big console franchises. And oh, yeah. I think you know it's a combination of the, the hardware is good enough, the screens are good enough, the bandwidth is good enough, and people are comfortable with that. So I know a lot of console gamers who are very skeptical about Call of Duty um, coming to mobile, who are now you know, avidly um, engaged in it. I, I was, sat on the train um, commuting out of London a couple of days ago and I was sat next to a guy playing Call of Duty um, on his own on, on the train and I, felt, I kind of felt awkward about asking him to move so I could get off the train because he was right in the middle of a, an intense battle on the phone but that's you know, it's, it's all genres now on mobile. Amazing so the uh, smartphone hardware finally catch up and uh, you, you just uh you have a chance to witness things that you couldn't imagine to witness a few years ago. There was no way people could play a Call of Duty as somewhere outside of their building, uh, of their home, yeah. you know, of their couch. Now you can, you can see them playing next to you on your commute. That's, that's amazing. 
Um, okay, let's switch the gears a little bit. Uh, let's talk about mobile advertising. Okay. Uh, how much advertisers spent last year and what should we expect for this year? And uh, is there anything um, to mention about what areas of mobile advertising grow faster than other areas? Mm. Yeah, so to put it in context, let's take that, that 120 billion number we had for the size of the stores last year. So the, okay. the estimate advertising for like for like is 190 billion. So ad, mobile advertising monetization is already significantly bigger than what transacts through the stores. And it's actually growing faster. It's growing at over 25% year on year. So we're predicting around 240 billion as being the size of, um, of mobile advertising space in 2020. And I think there's a couple of a couple of things that are interesting in that. One is we're starting to see uh, big brands moving into that and, and then recognizing that this is a great way of reaching people. So we're seeing brands engage more with different apps, um, you know, whether they're games apps or, or, or whatever it might be, but seeing it as a good way of, of reaching people and we're seeing a bigger proportion of brand advertising shift onto mobile. So that's one trend. And I think the the other that's important to, to call out is more of a point on why it's so effective. And that hooks in with video. And we are very comfortable consuming short form video on mobile devices. We've seen this in with, with YouTube, um, 2019 with TikTok. Um, you know, we, we spend so much time watching video on mobile devices that a video advert feels quite natural and that creates a lot of, of, of opportunity for advertisers to have a, a, a deeper kind of engagement with, um, with, with consumers than maybe other platforms do. And I think there'll, there'll be a lot of innovation um, continuing to happen within the, the, the formats of, of mobile advertising in 2020. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, short video uh, format works perfectly because, you know, uh, for the most part, um, people do not have an opportunity to watch uh, a program like 40, 50, 60 minutes in length. Uh, like even the TV news, um, I don't watch, you know, Stephen Cabrera, the whole show. I just grab this seven, five minutes uh, clip shots to oh. get the gist of what, what they were talking about in the latest uh, episode. No, that's right. Um, but I, th I think brought, you know, just back on the branding point, I think it's worth right. just talking about that a bit as well. In that, it's it, we're seeing starting to see brands experiment with this a bit. So, um, you know, one example was LVMH, you know, one of the biggest, most prestigious brands in the world in luxury goods and so on. They actually partnered with one of the big um, sort of RPG mobile games, League of Legends. And they sponsored the eSports uh, tournament associated with League of Legends. And I, I don't know if you, you were aware, but within a lot of these games, you know, people are choosing skins for their, for their characters, clothes, outfits, and so on. And LVMH provided a, uh -huh. a branded LVMH skin for, within League of Legends for, for, for winners. So I thought that was really interesting that I don't think that would have happened even two or three years ago. And you put together the different kind of advertising opportunities that exist within mobile. Um, even, you know, we were talking about Call of Duty before. That's quite an immersive experience. There's billboards on sidewalks and in, in, within games. There's all these kinds of, of areas for, 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 for advertising within mobile apps that haven't been explored yet. It feels still like we're at a relatively early stage of it and yet it's so big already in terms of in terms of money all right so because people are kind of you know it's been written so many times that the average uh, click-through rate of uh online banner ad was like less than one percent uh it's it's been true for years and uh uh for so many brands it it, it become pretty much a challenge to reach out the, the bigger audience to attract these people to their brand because they just don't look at the ad advertising at all. They're using ad blocks, uh, plugins, and um, it looks like the game itself 
like the way how you spend your time is pretty much the new frontier where you can introduce a brand because people are relaxed. They're not, um, they're not being, um, it's not like the, you're cutting them off guard, but they are more, they would perceive your advertising from your brand, uh, better, uh, if you compare the ads you will be running just, uh, on the website, um, even on social media. And when you're doing the same advertising in the, within a mobile game and just make sure it's relevant, it's not like uh, out of the blue and out of the contest, but people will be more um, engaged with your brand when they see an ad uh, inside a mobile game, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, and that, you know, that relevance point is right, that you, that you say that's always the case with advertising. But I think there's the, the opportunity to be very engaging and very relevant within within mobile because it is you know it's so personal so i, I think there's um, a, a lot a lot more we'll see happening there right uh, now let's talk about video streaming wars so let's talk about baby yoda and okay. mandalorian uh, sorry just kidding <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, no podcast is complete without a reference to baby yoda right yeah absolutely so w- w- what is the current landscape uh, what apps and platforms are involved and uh, how does these apps popularity look in numbers yeah, so this was a big topic for last year, and we saw this this spike in in sessions. So a good way to look at it is the number of sessions, the number of time people actually pick up their smartphone and, and start a session to, to engage with some content, entertainment content. And between 2017 and 2019, we saw that grow 50%, which is, is huge. And yes. Yeah, and and just to put a number on a rough number, we looked at estimating how that worked into number of hours um, on Android phones. So just on Android phones across the world, it's about where we expect it to be this year anyway in 2020 is around 700 billion hours, which is a, a mad number. <laughs> it is. People with their smartphones and devices watching content that's being served to them. And, you know, the, the big stories, of course, I guess Disney Plus, um, Apple TV Plus, these got um, the headlines there. Um, and it's this change into this, this subscription model and, and all the, the battles about who's going to win and, and what subscriptions people are going to have. One trend we saw um, stand out quite noticeably is that people are paying for multiple subscriptions. Okay. So we, we took a look towards the end of last year, once Disney Plus was up and running really, and we looked at the proportion of Netflix iPhone users in the US who were also using Disney Plus, and it was around 25%, which is a, a pretty significant number considering Disney Plus didn't launch, you know, hadn't launched that much earlier. So I think what we're seeing is people taking out multiple subscriptions. Um, I'm sure they're they're testing and 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 may consolidate down. Um, but yeah, it's this, I mean there has to be some some uh, consolidation or bundling going on uh, this year. I'm sure we've seen parts of that. I mean Disney have an advantage, so they've already bundled Disney Plus and Hulu and ESPN into a package and that certainly gives them an advantage but there was a i don't know if you, if you saw during the year there was a partnership between hulu and spotify to bundle subscriptions so mm-hmm. i think that's going to be something that providers are going to really need to think long and hard about what's their partnership or, or subscription bundling strategy otherwise consumers are going to they're going to get tired or or broke from the number of uh, subscriptions that they have here. Uh, by the way, I heard somewhere that Disney Plus uh, ate like a you know pretty significant portion of the Netflix uh, revenue for the last quarter of 2019. Can you confirm it or tell me anything about it? Um, not particularly. I mean, I think what I'd say is certainly they got off to a good start and they were, you know, that's that, that big overlap of Netflix users. So there are a significant portion of Netflix users who are um, experimenting and trying Disney Plus. And uh-huh. you know, logic says that in the, the long term, that's certainly a, a threat to, to Netflix revenues. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still thinking about uh, should I uh, buy a subscription for Disney Plus because I'm paying for Netflix and uh, Amazon Prime already. 
Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's sure. exactly the thing. That's where we, where we all are, I guess. And, uh, right. Yeah. How much subscription will be enough? How many subscriptions should I have uh, to cover it all? Um, that's, that's the question. Yes. Yeah, that's it. So it, I think that's going to shake out, I'm sure, in the next you know, 12, 18 months. Right, um, right. There, time, there has time to be some kind of thing. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, I think the other bit on streaming, though, is maybe that got missed. We talked a little bit about TikTok before, but that that's taking a lot of, t uh, can, absorbing a lot of time and we're maybe linking back to the Gen Z demographic, but just as a, as a stat for, we, we looked at last year and people who are using TikTok on average are spending 12 hours a month with TikTok, which is you know, way more, it's significantly more than double the amount of time that Netflix users are spending you know, on, on phone. Obviously on Netflix, you may use other devices as well, but, but there's, it's not just the subscription challenge in, in terms of this this competition for attention and competition for, for people's time and entertainment. There are other video platforms. Social and video are starting to merge with TikTok at the front of it. So, for you know, whilst the subscription guys are battling it out, there there are other sort other video content providers who are taking a bigger share of, of our time as well. All right. Uh, now let's cover a few questions I have for you. Just it's kind of a rapid fire, quick questions. Uh, work aside, just uh, personal use. Are you iOS or an Android person? Um, I am iOS actually. I've tried Android, but I'm I am iOS. I have to admit. Uh, you couldn't just handle Android complexity, right? Yeah, I, I just I never quite made the I never quite bridged. You know, I did I did try, but I got drawn back in. So. I see. Um, uh, do you remember what was your first mobile phone? Um, first, my my own first mobile phone was a uh, I think it was the seven thousand series Nokia. It was the one with the the front slides down to put the microphone near your mouth, which I guess it wasn't very good microphone technology. But the, the one thing I remember about it, it was very cool because it had a web browser on it. And I could get the football scores on a Saturday faster than my mates by frantically typing away on this web browser to get the, get the scores. So that was, uh, I felt very, uh, very privileged. Fascinating by current standards. <laughs> um, <laughs> What is your favorite app and why? Um, favorite, I, I kind of have to be a, maybe a bit boring and say Spotify. Um, I've always been into music streaming now. I was one of the early hackers with the illegal version of Napster connecting up my computer with my, uh, this is probably in breach of some law saying this, I know. but then anyway. <laughs> Long time ago, so um, yeah, so the, the, the idea of, of music on demand, music streaming, the the jukebox on your on your device has always appealed to me, and I think Spotify have executed on that really well over the years with the the discover features, the you know, the curated lists, the um, yeah, radar of new releases. I, I just find it it fits very very well for me. So I've got a lot of um, yeah, I mean kudos to the guys at Spotify who just keep getting it right. I think. All right. So, um, can you think of an app that is uh, overrated in your estimate? Like, there's a lot of hype, but just doesn't deserve it. Yeah. All right. All right. So this is really personal, but anything to do with electric scooters, I, I, I just don't. You know, I I go to Tel Aviv and LA, and I get it. There, I can see going down the boulevard on your electric scooter, but a rainy January, February day in Paris, Berlin, London. I just don't get why people are, are doing electric scooters, and the I, I get the apps kind of useful for it, but I'm sorry, I just I, I, I just can't connect with them. You just don't get how how hard you should how uh, how you should love your <laughs> scooter to be able to drive it in the raining <laughs> weather. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just should. wouldn't. Yeah, so maybe I, I don't know. I, I think I'm missing something, but yeah. No, be, it's, it's for me. To... I just. It's yeah, way, totally. Way that's, that's hard. It's really hard to get the idea um, how it should work in the rainy weather. So, yeah. uh, what new app technologies are you most excited about? Um, I think there's technologies. I'm actually just just to bridge with the last question. What I am excited about is somebody cracking, really cracking mobility. 
that that mobility platform app and you know this, this talk about mobility as a service that I know three or four of our customers working on it at the moment but that point of an app where you get I'm here point A I need to go to point B just tell me how to do it if that's a uh, a hire car, if it's a ride share, if it's a, a train, um, and just put all those bits together, give me all the tickets and get me there. And I'm really excited for, for somebody executing on that mobility platform. Um, I think that will make a big difference to, to, to lots of people's lives. Um, I know there's people working on it. I've not seen a, uh, one that's absolutely nailed it yet, but I think we're not too far away. Okay, cool. We'll see. Now, uh, before I let you go, um, how people can get in touch with you and get more information? Um, so my email is pbarnes at appani.com, but there's lots of uh, contact details on the on the website as well. So always happy to connect with people and through LinkedIn, of course, as well, if you need to do that. Great. Thanks a lot for your time and coming on our podcast, Paul. Thank you. That's a pleasure, Archon. Thank you for, you for the invite. Bye-bye. And that was Paul Burns, Managing Director of Europe, Middle East, Asia at App Eddy. To listen to more episodes, subscribe to our app podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. Just search for Business of Apps and you will find us easily. Once you subscribe, you will be able to get new episodes on your smartphone, tablet, or computer as soon as we release them. And please, don't forget to leave us a review and comment. It is highly appreciated. And uh, also, all episodes will be available on thebusinessofapps.com. Till the next time. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Business of Apps podcast. For more, head on over to businessofapps.com.